So good morning, everybody. Come on, this is going to be like school. If you don't participate, it's going to be a long day. Uh, so hi, my name's Dave. I work in the DX team. I am a principal tech evangelist. Check me out, right? Woo! Which, yeah, thank you very much. I see my mum's in. Um, my job is basically to try and connect the dots. You know what Microsoft is like? We think in our little domains, but actually the beauty of who we are as a company is what happens when you connect the stuff and you look left to right. Um, I would like to tell you that my job is about projecting out into the future, trying to understand how humans are going to behave. I look at uh, academic report, industry, all of that. I would love to be able to tell you that, but if you really want to know what I do for a living day to day, you just have to ask my wife. When we're out somewhere, she says, what does your, your husband do? She says, him? Oh, he just talks bollocks for a living. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so, I stand in front of you. My whole uh, perspective on life and my career is to try and upskill humans so that they can get more from the amazing technology that surrounds us. Uh, one of my fears about working in this industry is actually we spend far too long talking about the technology rather than the humans that use it. And so a few years ago, I set out to try and write this wrong. I wrote a book called Business Reimagined, which is about how the way we work today doesn't work. I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. And then I followed up with another book, which is very pertinent to today's times, it's about the rise of the humans. And this, on one level, is about our personal relationship with technology and on a second level it's about the oncoming uh, disruption opportunity that is coming from a world of artificial intelligence and lots of data. Um, there are two things you should know about my books. Number one, I'm a cheap date, that's why I'm here. So if you would like a copy of these you can get them for free if you have a Kindle or a Kindle app. If you don't have a Kindle or a Kindle app just tweet me and I'll send you a download code. The second thing you should know about my books is, um, and I'm always a bit embarrassed to have to say this in public, but look there was a, there was a point in my past life where I was a bit down on my luck. Uh, and uh, look, I did some things for money that I'm not terribly proud of today. Um, look, I was a management consultant, okay? Um, <clears throat> as a result of being a management consultant, you will find no answers in these books because I was a good consultant. Oh, yes. My books are just provocations. I want you to think differently, not about the technology, but about the outcome that it affects for the people that you're intended, the users, the consumers, the customers, whoever they are. But really it starts in this amazing world. And you guys live and breathe this world. We live in amazing times. The technology is changing at a pace that we've never seen before. And every time the, the pace gets quicker and quicker and quicker, and I can think of no better way to articulate the rate of change than to call upon one of these charts. We're familiar with this chart. This is the exponential curve. This is my favorite ever exponential curve because it plots the number of mentions of the phrase exponential growth <laughs> over the last six decades. <laughs> There is no better description of our current world than this slide, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but the reality for me, my big problem, and this is where I need your help, is if I look at what people do with technology today, all they're doing is they're replicating old ways of working. Most of the processes by which our organizations run, the structure that exists inside our organization, these are things that were designed in the 19th century. We are essentially still working like we're Victorians today. All we use this amazing technology to do is to make those old working practices a bit quicker or a bit cheaper. You know, I know, this is not the gift of the amazing technology that sits in front of us. Our challenge is how do we change what people do? How do we get them to live in a way that is fit for purpose, to work in a way that is fit for purpose for the technology that sits in front of them. And my fear is that if we don't do this, this whole cliche about working smarter is simply off the table, untenable. We cannot achieve it unless we fundamentally change what we do. The only choice we will have left unless we change is simply to work harder. Now, I don't know about you. I've reached that point in my career where the concept of me working harder for the remainder of my career was not exactly what I thought I'd be doing. So please, if not for me, for everybody else, we need to change. And the thing is, again, you guys know this in inherently, the, the opportunity, people talk about digital like it's a barrier. They don't oh, it's too much information, never find anything. Why they always talk like that, I don't know, but it just sounds good. And the thing is, we know that the opportunity, we have access to every fact, every opinion, every piece of knowledge our society has ever known, and we have access to it in a device that sits inside our pocket. This is amazing potential for our society. It's amazing potential for our businesses, for their customers, in terms of what we can do. We just have to help people break through the barrier. We have to help people see it for what it can be. 
And it starts with data. And I know data is the world's most boring topic. It's a bunch of numbers and all that stuff. But data is everything. I am telling you now, and I bet you already know this anyway, data is the fuel of our future. Every organization, your customers, your organization, my organization, will run on data. The ones, the companies that will succeed in the future will be the ones that choose to see data as a strategic asset rather than a byproduct of the business that they actually do. Because that data fuels everything that we're going to do. It fuels amazing things. It fuels a new wave of automation. It fuels a new wave of prediction. You've seen companies like us do this. We've been using lots and lots of data to start to accurately predict the future. Now, this is not some half-baked down the pub on a Saturday afternoon who's going to win the 320 at Chepstow prediction. This is statistically significant prediction. We did the last Football World Cup. We got 15 out of 16 World Cup games right. We have done uh, the, uh, we did the Scottish referendum. We got that right within 2% of the vote. You know we're a consumer company, so we've done X Factor. We've done Pop Idol and even highlight of my own personal career, the Eurovision Song Contest. Oh, yes. And you know that we make the algorithms that power that incredible prediction available to everyone. It's an API you call from Azure. How would you run your business? How would you advise your customers on their business in a world where you can accurately predict what will happen rather than reflect on what has? This is one of the biggest questions. We, the people in this room, we're going to have to answer that for our customers. What I think is making this possible is something I like to call a technological Copernican shift. Because like many of you, I spend far too long on Wikipedia looking for bizarre phrases. You remember a Copernican shift? Basically, it's 1534. Copernicus rocks up to his academic buddies. He says, you buggers have got this all wrong. It's not the sun that goes around the earth. It's the earth that goes around the sun. And in that instant, everything we knew about the world around us got turned on its head. I would argue that the same thing is about to happen to our personal relationship with technology because we live in a world today where the humans, they gravitate around technology. Think about it. Every time you want to use a piece of technology, you have to go to it. You pick up your phone, you sit in front of your PC, sit in front of your telly, you sit inside your car. But we know that we're moving to a world where the technology surrounds us. It's a world of ubiquitous computing. Every uh, floor tile, every light bulb, every wall, every window, every surface, no pun intended, is a device that is connected and spewing out data about the world around it. And if we take to that world of just huge, this ocean of data, this cacophony of data, and we add a layer of ambient intelligence, these are agents who work on our behalf, who know us as individuals and use their knowledge of us as individuals and the data they have access to, to deliver incredible value. We're already on this journey. You know that we're on this journey. You know about Cortana if you use iOS. You know about Siri if you use Android. You know about uh, Google Assistant. These are the first wave of ambient intelligent agents. Their power is everything. Our ability to understand the individual and to make sense of their world is the, the way by which we'll deliver them value. Now, what's making this possible is what I think is probably the most important technology that anybody on the planet is working on today. It's a technology called machine learning. Now, often, outside of rooms like this, they talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence like they're the same thing. I get that they are different, but for, for sake of argument, we'll call them the same thing just for this moment. Now, machine learning, you will know, is just simply the ability to spot patterns in lots of data, statistical pattern recognition. You will remember the first time you became aware of this technology, you won't have known maybe what it was called, but I guarantee you will have been aware of it because it was probably the first time you went to a search engine and as you were typing in your query, the search engine suggested the very thing you were about to type before you'd finished typing. And if you were like me, you were like, well, that's a bit weird. I'm looking over my shoulder, seeing who's looking. Statistical based pattern recognition. All the algorithm is doing is it's saying based on the characters you've just typed in and against the billions of other queries that have been typed into me today, the statistical probability of you going on to complete the sentence like this is 99%, so I'm going to suggest that as the next option. Now that basic ability ability to spot patterns in lots and lots of data enables us to build the most incredible services. These are services that are not just going to change our relationship with technology, they're going to change our relationship with each other as human beings. They will even, in the fullness of time, I would argue, change how we define what it actually means to be human. Here's a classic Microsoft example. This has been around for a few years now. This is using the power of machine learning to deliver real-time speech-to-speech language translation. You'd have seen it at Build. You've seen it at all sorts of events. But I need you to think about the transformational nature of this kind of stuff. And remember, it's just based on spotting patterns in, in, in data. Think about how this changes our world. I have an 11-year-old son. On the basis of this technology, do I bother to get my son to learn a foreign language at school? Because by the time he enters his world of work, that will be a redundant skill. 
Now, I get that's provocative. I get there are lots of reasons why we learn foreign languages. And of course, my son, he'll learn one or two languages at school just like everybody else. But as a result of this technology, he will be able to emerge from his education, not just speaking the one or two languages he's learned, but being able to speak another 152 languages, including Klingon, I might add, right, that will enable him to travel around the world communicating with locals as if he were a local. This will fundamentally change his cultural experience in his life, not to mention his job prospects. This stuff changes our world. We have a duty of care as people in this industry, as technologists, to get people ready, to help them understand what we can achieve with this. This is such a big deal that even the computer scientists are calling it something special. Right? So the computer scientists, they look at a world of AI and machine learning and they talk about the third computer age. Now you will know, you will remember from your computer science lessons that the first computer age was the world of analog computers, personified by Charles Babbage and his analytical engine, a design so complicated he never finished it in his lifetime. It took the Science Museum until 2006 to complete that design. We're all familiar with the second computer age, which is the world of the, of the digital microprocessor, the digital computer. This is the world that we live in. But the third computer age is a world of artificial intelligence and machine learning and is fundamentally different to those first two ages for two very important reasons. The first is that in, a, in the third computer age, in a world of AI, we no longer instruct the machines what to do. We no longer give them instructions line by line, code by code. Instead, we help them to learn. And what's interesting about this is this is actually the way human beings learn. And it's counterintuitive to the way that we think we're taught language at school. Here's a great example. This comes from some proper grown-up academic research from Cambridge University that basically shows if you speak English, as long as I, and if you don't speak English, this will work in your own native language, but you'd obviously have to translate the text. As long as I keep the first and last characters of the word in the right place, I can mix up all of the other characters. I can even misspell words and you will still be able to read the text. Can you read the text? Yes, of course you can. What I love about this is it's contradictory to the way that we think we learn language at school because when we're at school we think we learn language by learning the rules of language, learning the logic of language. We're taught things like I before E except after C. But what they don't teach us at school is there are actually 923 exceptions to the I before E rule. There are more exceptions to the I before E rule than there are to the bloody rule itself. Language isn't logical, it doesn't follow rules, it follows patterns. And we innately know this as human beings because from the day we learn to read until the day we die, we create, curate and tend to our own personal pattern of language. Every time you read something, you are making your own personal pattern of language slightly better. Just how algorithms work. And when your brain gets presented with something as ambiguous as this, it does not call on the rules, it doesn't call on the logic, it simply calls on the pattern, and it uses the pattern to reassemble away the words in a way that you can understand them. Now the second reason I love this example is it shows you the limitation of today's machine learning and today's artificial intelligence, because the algorithms, they're only as good as the patterns that they've been provided with. What do you think happens when I show this slide to somebody who's just beginning to learn to speak English? Or if I'd shown it to my son, I don't know, maybe seven years ago, when he was forming his own language skills? They can't read it. It makes no sense to them because they haven't established enough of a pattern. This is why, for the time being, this is not the Terminator. The machines and the robots are not going to take over. But this different ability, this separate from writing code through to helping machines learn, is the first fundamental difference of the third computer age. The second difference for the third computer age is simply this. We move away from a world of binary. No longer is it a one or a zero, a yes or a no, a black or white. It is a maybe. This is hard. Because we are going to be surrounded by a world of probabilistic determination. We will be seeing answers for really, really important things that will be based on a probability, not a certainty. Now, why is this important? Look at how our usage of algorithms is changing. Look how much deeper they are in our lives. A few years ago, we only used to really use algorithms to decide which restaurant to go to, to which mountain bike to buy. Think about how much deeper they've got into our lives. These algorithms are doing things like determining our medical status. I may go to the doctors in the future, they may say, Dave, we think you're going to die of prostate cancer. 68% probability. As a human being, what do I do with that? That's really, really difficult. It's one of the great challenges we'll, we'll have. 
And we have to understand what this means because our customers are going to be using services that will be based on probability. This is the second and final fundamental change. But it means we've got to change our approach to our relationship with technology. And maybe not the people in this room, but certainly the people outside this room. Because the way that technology is portrayed, specifically things like artificial intelligence, is it's always portrayed as an adversarial battle. There's a newspaper article on artificial intelligence. What's the picture that goes next to it? The Terminator. There's a conversation about robots. Same thing. Time and time again, we pitch this adversarial, humans versus machines. As technologists, I bet you know that that's completely wrong. I bet you innately know that actually the real way to solve this problem is not humans versus machines, it's humans plus machines. What is it that I can do that leverages the best of technological capability with the best of human ability to get me an outcome that is further than I could have got to on myself? This is where we are going. It's where we're going as a company. It's where we're going as technologists to help lift what humans can do. And we really need it, right? Because we need technology that can deliver human outcomes because it doesn't happen today. Here's an example. This is actually a photo of my son. It's last April. We're standing on a beach called Long Beach on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Now, in order to get there, I did what many of you will do, is I had to endure a whole series of technology challenges in order to make this a reality. Because I did that whole thing. I do, we tried to decide to do the whole thing online. So what do you do when you're trying to plan a holiday online? Well, first of all, you spend an evening in front of the computer, arguing in front of the computer as a family, deciding where you're going to go. So now we know where we're going to go. We're going to go to Vancouver. Now we've got to figure out how we're going to get there. There's another evening you're going to spend in front of a sky scanner, airline websites. Now you know where you're going to go, how you're going to get there, where you're going to stay. Here's another evening you'll spend in front of Expedia hotel websites. Where you're going to go, how you're going to get there, where you're what are you going to do when you arrive? Yes, all of this stuff. Each one of those is a technological hoop that the technology is forcing me, the human, to jump through. As a human being, all I really care about is I want to tell my family, I want to go to Vancouver. I want to be able to say to the system, I'd like to take the family to Vancouver in April. And I want the system to know who I am. I want the system to know who my family are. The system knows where Vancouver is, knows the airlines I like to fly, the hotels I like to stay in. And based on that information, can then deliver me a human outcome, which is a suggested itinerary for my trip. This is the world that you will know Microsoft calls conversation as a platform. Oh. This is the ability test, to stitch test. together. Easy. <laughs> Bloody hell, I'm hearing voices now. <laughs> this is the ability to stitch together disparate agents, disparate services. And you're going to have to ask me the question. Easy. <laughs> this is going to be fun. To stitch together these disparate things to deliver an outcome that is human in its intent. Now, I have a video. This is a video that was used from last year's build. You will have seen it before, but maybe not with this kind of context. And it shows this concept in action. Now, but there's a caveat about this video. Because this video was created by the cream of our marketing talent, right? <laughs> in the United States. <laughs> to say this video is a bit perky is a massive understatement, right? On a scale of 0 to 10, this is obviously an 11 in perkiness. This video is so perky, it should come with Microsoft branded sick bags, right? <laughs> but if you could put the perkiness to one side, and instead, as technologists, look at the principle, look at the functionality that's being delivered, this will give you a sense of the kind of world that we're looking at. Cortana, I want a dress like this. Can you help me find it? I like this one. <laughs> yes, please. Can I get it in a size six? Cool. Cortana, please give them my payment and shipping info.
Now, I don't know about you, but every Friday night of my life, right, it's just like that. <laughs> Again, look, it's easy for me to poke fun at marketing. I think that does a great job at pitching the concept of this to a, let's call it a business audience. But you understand the technology that sits beneath it. This is about a world of connected agents. What are we talking about? 15 years ago, the launch of .NET, I actually feel like it was a bit longer ago than that, but never mind. Um, we would be standing up here having a conversation probably about the web and e-commerce, and someone like me would be standing up and basically saying, if you or your customer doesn't have a website, you are not open for business. We feel so strongly for this. I would say to you, in the future, if you or your company or customers do not have an agent, if my agent cannot talk to your agent, you are not open for business. I think it's that significant. The best news in all of this is that the humans that will use these services are changing their behavior. It's wonderful. And we often, I think as technologists, I don't think we celebrate this enough. I don't think we celebrate just how far the people on the other side of the screens have come in their expectations of technology. Now, there are lots of examples that play out in our society from time to time. And my favorite one that's current is this scenario, right? How do you react to this scenario today? Because my bet is how you react to this scenario today is fundamentally different to how you would have reacted to this scenario about 12 months ago. Right, so how do you react to this scenario today? Phone tap. Phone tap, exactly. You expect contactless. 12 months ago, it would be four digits. There's a little test you can do of yourself or your partner or your family to see how digitally engaged they are because it's what happens in this scenario where you approach the cashier and as you approach the cashier, card at the ready, phone at the ready, and as you go, you're just about to tap and the cashier goes, don't do contactless. <laughs> and if your reaction is like mine, which is like, you what? <coughs> This is like the 20, oh no, I'm going to have to type in four, this is like the worst thing that's happened, I'm going to type in four digits now, you know. That's how digitally engaged you are. But it's a lovely example because it shows you about delivering value to people's lives. When you deliver value, when you get it right, not only do people use it, but they want more. Who thinks that 30 quid, the 30 quid limit is not enough, right? Yeah, we need more because the thing's bloody brilliant. And we've gone on our own journey as individuals. We've started with that. I remember the first time I used it, it was a really awkward. I didn't know what to do as a technologist. You kind of think, well, there must be some kind of data transfer. How long do I need to stay? You know, I can't just tap it. It can't work. Do you know what I mean? It was awkward. It was ugly. And it was weird. And it was like my first kiss. It was horrible, right? <laughs> But now, look at me, I walk up the thing, I've got a little flourish, I'm like, check me out, bam, I'm in and away. Because you've delivered value to my life, I expect it. Same principle exists for the people that we're looking to deliver applications to and services to. Here's another lovely example of how the evolution of the human capacity has changed in its reaction to digital. This is a story from last summer. Some of you will have seen it, did the rounds on social. It's a beautiful story. There is a DJ in Glasgow. He's getting on a train to Sheffield. Being a DJ is not particularly prepared. He gets on a train, he's hungry, and then he finds out that the buffet car is closed. So what do you do when you're a hungry DJ on a long train journey with no buffet car? Well, you think, do you know what? I'm a DJ, right? I'll call on my social posse. I will tweet the fact that I am hungry and on a moving train. And one of my fans on the platform between here and Sheffield will pick me up a sandwich. Turns out he's not that popular. <laughs> Then he starts to think, hang on a minute, I live in a digital society. I live in a world where I know explicitly exactly where my train is. Domino's has the equivalent service for its pizzas. In theory, it should be possible to connect these two services and get pizza delivered to a moving train. This is exactly what he sets about. He orders, he figures out that by the time the pizza will be ready, he will be at Darlington Station. So he orders the pizza for Darlington Station. He gets the confirmation message. He's getting excited. Look at his happy little DJ face. Yeah? There he is. And then he gets the confirmation. It's left. It's left Domino's. It's on its way. The train pulls into the station. The brakes go on. And look what happens. about that video is, is the expression on, on the Domino's, the faces of the Domino's staff. You would think that they do this every day of their lives, right? 
Look at his happy little face, you know. <laughs> I too would be this smug if I just had pizza delivered to a moving train. Now look, the point of this story is not just because it's a brilliant story, but there's a principle that sits behind this that I want you to think about. Here we have a regular, normal, everyday human being. Well, all right, he's a DJ, but you get my point, right? Who has thought in this world it must be possible to make this kind of yeah. sense? If you've got other stuff to be doing, shall I just... But the morning ones were a bit difficult, but after that, but quite all right. And then I'll, I'll rehash it and we... Just do you know, if, if this wasn't our facility, I'd be throwing my weight round. Well, now, really and I'd be like, oh, do you know who I am? No, I'm just like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> the um, good stuff. All right, where was I? Uh, yeah, so, later. normal human being who has thought it must be feasible for this nice. to happen, to be yeah. able to make this well, service possible. Your, your opinion, customers no, are I'm doing exactly the same thing. Well, and maybe your and customers aren't the in the AV room. The uh, currently, right now, in a little area. conversation. Actually, we should listen. Maybe I'll get interesting in a minute. <laughs> I don't know. It's great and tall. Is that why the room was put down? Oh, I'm just going to drive on. So um, you need to think about your customers. No, you do this no, yourself. No, Every time you have a great experience of anyway, digital, obviously your aspirations change for every yeah, other yeah, service that you use. And you I'm think, actually, do you know what? Maybe anyway. I should be able yeah, to do this here. Yeah. You organise a brilliant family get-together on Facebook. And you think, that's amazing. How simple that was to do. And then you go, you can't even book a bloody meeting room in the office, right? No, uh, this is the challenge. And I kind of think it's like one of those weird desk toys that your dad used to have or your mad uncle at Newton's Cradle. And I just think our job is technology. Every now and again is when new technology, stuff that really changes the game, comes along. We have a duty of care to go to people who are going to use these services. And we need to give them a gentle nudge right? to say, look at this new technology. Think about how you can use that. The first time you use contactless would be an example. And if you get it right as technologists, if you can deliver value to them, guess what happens? They come right back and they give you a gentle nudge to say, that was brilliant. I want more. We should be planning for yeah, smart, yeah, sophisticated no one knows human beings who innately understand the value of digital no in their lives, the and we should <laughs> work really, really <laughs> hard to live up to that expectation. It's in the room now. So, what can you do with all this stuff? So, when I say no one knows, the first thing that you've got to understand is that you've got to help your customers and your own organisation digitise every aspect of your business. If any asset of your organisation or your customer's organisation does not exist in the digital world, it's invisible. You cannot work with it. You certainly can't innovate with it. So we have to help our customers understand that. And this is not, the physic, not just the physical assets, it's the intangible assets too. It's the knowledge that you have as an organisation. It's the way in which your people are connected. These are all assets that have massive value, but they have to exist in digital terms. That means You've got to be in the cloud. You've got to exist in the cloud. If you're not in the cloud, we can't innovate with you. And again, this isn't so much for you, it's for your customers. Once you're there, then you need to start to figure out how are we going to fuel the machine? How are we going to get more and more data? And the beautiful thing about this is that we are swimming in a world of data. It's just that often it's invisible. We can't see it. We can't visualize it. Here's an example, a lovely example of how we can bring that invisible data to light. Does anybody know what kind of data this is? Smartwatch, health data. It's a very specific kind of health data because it's actually the health data for my dog. <laughs> right? This is Meg. You will notice that Meg is a Border Collie. We actually rescued Meg and her sister last May, and if you know your dogs, you'll know that the Border Collies are basically the sociopaths of the dog world, right? So when we take Meg and her sister out for a walk, Meg does this weird thing. She actually walks backwards, locked onto the humans, because she thinks that all human are sheep. Right, and frankly, after last summer, I'm not sure she's wrong. <laughs> Bit of politics. <laughs> Come on, work with it, easy. <clears throat> and the thing is, I got so worried about Meg because she wasn't getting any exercise. She was walking backwards the entire thing. Her sister, meanwhile, is doing what dogs should do, which is running around, having a great time. I got so worried about this, but I couldn't visualize it. So what do I do? As a technologist, you do exactly what a technologist would do. I instrumented her. I put a little device on her collar, and now, I can see the data, I can correlate it against the other dogs that we could have. I can see, actually, do you know what, she's doing all right in terms of that. That basic principle to make invisible data visible is what we can do for all of our organizations, for our customers. And we're doing it to ourselves as human beings. How many of you have some kind of smartwatch or whatever? 
I have one. I love this thing. It tells me my heart rate. The thing I love me about my heart rate is I've always kind of more or less pretty much, give or take, I've always had a heart rate, right? It's always been there. It's just that this device makes it visible, makes it tangible. I can correlate that data with things that are happening elsewhere in my life and I can use that to change my behavior. That principle is no different to what we can do with organizations, but we have to make the data visible. In order to really drive this to the right destination, however, we've got to stop thinking about ourselves. We've got to stop thinking about our products, the things that we're doing for our clients. And instead, what is it like to be a customer of your customers? What is it that they're trying to deliver? We know this from our own personal experience, because there are many times in our life where organizations fail to get it right. This is my favorite example. This is my personal life. It's the grocery retail experience. Now, I'm the kind of guy, I still like to actually go to the supermarket to do my shopping because I'm not that organized and I kind of need inspiration as I'm walking down the aisles. And what I love about my grocery retail experience is that the retailer has no bloody clue about me as an individual. They think I'm just somebody who's there to worship their brand. Because what happens, and you will have this experience, is as I go to the checkout, I hand over two pieces of plastic and in return I get two pieces of paper. So I give them my credit card, I give them my loyalty card, and they give me a receipt and they give me another piece of paper. Now this paper is essentially a love letter that they write to themselves. It's a voucher. And it's a letter that basically says, Dave, we value you as a customer. We want you to be a loyal customer. And because we want you to be a loyal customer, we want you to know if you had gone somewhere else for your grocery shopping, you would have saved £2.63. But because we want you to be a loyal customer, we're going to give you that £2.63 back if you come and visit us within the next seven days and you remember to bring this love letter that we've written to ourselves. <laughs> now listen, I am a gentleman of a certain age. I am barely lucky if I can remember my own bloody name in the morning, never mind to bring another piece of paper with me to the supermarket next time in. If you really cared about me as an individual, if you really cared about me as a customer, what would you do? You just give me the £2.63 there and then, no messing around. And we have this old analog definition of what loyalty is or what customers mean that is not fit for purpose in our digital society. We've got to think about these outcomes. We've got to change our perspective. We've got to understand this basic principle of digital. Who remembers these guys? Yeah, excellent. So this is Funboy3 and, and Banana Rama who did a cover of an, an old song called It Ain't What You Do, It's The Way That You Do It. It's height of British pop, right, in the mid-80s. And I love it because it's the principle for digital. It's something that we all need to take with us. That you must not, you must never, ever confuse what you do with how you do it. What you do, I don't care what organization you're in, I don't care what you make, what services you have, I guarantee you I could buy something that is near enough equivalent from somewhere else. It's a you think Microsoft is the only organization that's in collaboration? Of course we're bloody not. What makes you special as an organization, what makes you really, really good and important to your customers is how you choose to deliver that service. This is the principle of digital that we've really got to come to terms with. It's hard for us technologists because we still want to tinker, we want to do the product stuff. But it's the community we create around the, your platform. It's the community you create around the apps. It's the thing that you enable your customers' customers to do. These are the things that make you special. And if in doing this, and trust me, this is not what you think this slide is about, <laughs> You can deliver real value to the people that you care about most. And it reminds me of this story. This is about focusing on outcomes rather than process. I don't know, you guys must have been coming to Thames Valley Park for years, right? And you know that Thames Valley Park is kind of always a work in progress. There's always something going on. In particular, we've got these fantastic new speed bumps. They're about 15 feet high. They're just amazing, right? You have to slow down considerably. And the other day, I was coming in here, and it was very, very early in the morning. So it was about 5 a.m. And as I'm coming in to Thames Valley Park, they, they've got this um, little golf buggy that the security guys drive around. And there's one of the security guys in his golf buggy. And, and what he's doing is he's standing in the middle of the, of the, of the carriage, carriageway, and he's putting these little dollops of white powder down the center of the carriageway. Now it's 5 a.m., I am obviously early, and I'm a curious guy. So I walk up to the guy, I said, what are you doing? So I'm pointing down elephant powder. I'm like, elephant powder, what's that for? Well, it keeps the elephants away. Like, but there aren't any elephants in Reading. And he just looks at me and smiles. He goes, I oh, know, it's great stuff, isn't it? <laughs> I'm here all week. Now, the thing is, our organizations, our customers' organizations, they're all full of elephant powder. Shit you do that is completely redundant, irrelevant in a modern digital society. 
Our challenge as technologists is to spot the elephant powder. It's to rip it up, it's to burn it, it's to get rid of it. The elephant powder is the stuff that holds us back. This is the stuff that prevents us from delivering real innovation to the people that we care most about. So look, I'm going to wrap up now. I want to leave you with a couple of things. The first is I want you to try and get technology in its rightful place. And this is hard for us as technologists, right? We need to understand that technology is the least important thing that we have to worry about. It's not unimportant. It's not irrelevant. It's the least important. And I can think of no better way of articulating this than go to a quote from Pablo Picasso, of all people, who in the mid-60s in Paris is being interviewed by some art magazine. And why you would ask Pablo Picasso this question, I don't know. But they say, hey, Pablo, what do you think about computers? And even though computers in Pablo's mid-60s Paris are different to the computers we have today in our pockets and on our desk, his answer was brilliant because it still stands true today. He simply said, computers are useless. All they can give me is answers. What I need is something that can ask the right questions. And ladies and gentlemen, that's something. It's you. That's your bloody job. Your job is to figure out what is the question that we or our customer is actually trying to answer. And you know as technologists, if you're clear on that question, if you're crisp on that question, we all know the technology will make short work of the results. So I want to leave you with this. This is not my future, right? This is not the Terminator. And believe it or not, the internet is not Skynet. I have a very different view of the future. And I bet that many of you share this view. I want a world where instead of this adversarial battle with humans versus machines, it becomes about humans plus machines. It's about how do we extend the reach of human capability using this amazing technology? How do we stand on the shoulders of these digital giants and use that technology to help us achieve more than we ever could do on our own? This is the challenge that lies in front of us. And the thing I love about this is a debate. We've had this for years as a society. I remember when I was a kid, when I was at school, I was doing my maths exams. I was doing my maths O-level. And if you don't know what O-level is, it's kind of like a GCSE, but harder, right? <laughs> it was a point in our lives where we were debating the role of pocket calculators in the education of our children. As a result of that societal debate, I did my maths O-level with a bloody logbook and a slide rule. Now listen, I'm a better mathematician with a calculator than I am with a tabulated bit of paper and a slidey bit of plastic. Yes, I need to know the basics of arithmetic, but once I do, the technology fundamentally lifts my capability as a human being. It's exactly the same principle today. So what we need to do is we need to help equip our society with those basic skills. And those basic skills are not whether they can use Word or PowerPoint or even Visual Studio in specific versions or specific coding languages. It's basic principles. It's things like critical thinking, deep thinking, creative thinking, the ability to communicate, the ability to collaborate, the ability to keep each other safe online. If we can do our part to make sure that every member of our society has access to these skills, then and only then can we as human beings rise up and live up to all of the potential that technology has to offer. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great day. Thank you very, very much.